Okay, so variables in Haskell. It's unfortunate that this talk collides with the discussion on the on a state theme because I have a bunch of things to say about how you do variables in Haskell. And, you know, people have this idea that you cannot have these things if you want to get pure. And this is, this is wrong in some levels. So, uh, first of all, if you want to talk about compilers and type theory and this kind of a stuff, I'm glad to, to talk, but I'm shy, so you can come to me and... Uh, anyway, so, so what do I mean with variables in Haskell? And, and why would you want to do this? So there are several reasons. And well, the first one is because many times you are lazy. You just open a book, you want to implement your graph algorithm, and it's in this beautiful imperative style. So it's, it's, sometimes it's really hard to turn this into pure things. So it's, it's useful to have some kind of notion of variable which would allow you to you know, bridge the gap and be able to use this algorithm without having to think too hard about how to turn it into some kind of pure functional thing. The second reason is, is performance. We'll see later that sometimes you can get more performance by having some small destructive adapts in your code. Uh, but of course, you shouldn't do this too early, as usual, because uh, if you use Haskell, GHC usually generates better code than you. So, uh, and the third and the most important thing is that if we are using threads in a Haskell program, we are already into some kind of impure world. And if we need to synchronize between these two threads, the all, the, what, two or, or many more threads, we really need to use some kind of mutable variables. And this is really hard to work around. You know, that's, that's the primitive that, that leads to all these kind of variables. The nice thing is that uh, in Haskell and GHC, uh, diff you have different models of concurrency and parallelism, and this gives rise to different kinds of variables with different properties. So we'll, we'll, we are going to explore how this model looks like and how the variables uh, look like. So this is our landscape. You can see that we have like different axes in which we can put these different kinds of variables. Uh, the, main, the, the main thing is that you have, well, like, like the cheapest one, which are very simple. You have STREF, IREF. These are going to be like your, uh, your uh, hatred uh, C variables. But they are very cheap. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have very clever variables, which take care of a lot of synchronization, of a lot of you know, uh, semaphores, all kind of things. Uh, so really, from the, fr it's, uh, from the green line to the left, these are really things which are not safe to use in multi-thread environments. And then to the other side, you use it for the thread communication. But another nice axis is that the top part is all pure. So the thi even if you use some kind of m variable notion, the code you get back is still going to be pure. It's, an, it's not going to be in I.O. Whereas, well, the bottom part, you really are going to need some kind of I.O. in your program. Uh, so as I said, different variables actually come from different models of computation. And in order to understand how variables work, we need to understand these three models. And these three models are going to be, first, just single-threaded applications. Then the second model is going to be parallel programming, where the parallelism is hidden to us. So it's automatically done by the compiler in some way. And then the third model is some kind of parallel and concurrent programming, where everything is explicit. And we have to explicitly ask for a to mutate a variable and ask to read the variable and this kind of stuff. OK, so let's start with the first one, pure mutable references. So this is going to be into something called the ST monad, which uh, is supposed to be something like uh, resemble like a state monad, but it's actually implemented using references. So you can think like somebody put an effort to build a monad where the state is not the usual, you know, this uh, an extra parameter which gets threaded through functions. It's really a C-like thing on your memory, which you destructively update, and it's a step. And reference are going to be 
uh, explicit in this model, and they are going to be mapped to what you call ST refs, which is something like state references. And you can have as many as you want. You can create many of these references and just get the, get the content and update them while you are running the program. The nice thing is that at the end, all of this is going to turn into a pure thing because you have your computation using the state thing, but at the end, you just run a st and you get a pure value. So it's like you are somehow encapsulating this small thing, which is a state, which I think is very relevant to the discussion we, that what we, we had yesterday on, on, the, on a state uh, keynote. Because we can really encapsulate this small state in, your, in this part of your program, and then the rest is completely ignorant of whether you use these variables or not. You cannot escape. And if we have time at the end, uh, I will explain you how all of this is done, because this is actually something that you can see only looking at the type. It's, it's really the type is the one giving you this power of ignoring all of these side effects. So let me just use a very simple example, which is summing a list of integers, and instead of using the typical recursive thing, we are going to use uh, a mutable reference. So you can see uh, you have a new stref, which is something which creates like a new cell in your memory. And in this case, we start with value 0. And then we're going to go through a loop, which at every step modifies this stref by adding uh, a value. So it just takes the first thing, adds this to the, to, the, to the cell, goes to the next one, adds it to the cell, and at the very end, we use read stref to get the value from the cell. So this should look familiar because, I mean, maybe you are some really strange people who only did functional programming, but most people before did some kind of imperative programming. So this, this should feel like uh, it's the same kind of stuff, really. But as I said, you don't need to only have one, uh, one reference. You can have more than one. So in, in this case, if we want to compute the average, we can also use a reference to compute the length of the list. So if you see, we are just uh, creating exactly the same thing, new stref, and then use modify stref as previously. I'm just using sac here to add one of, on every step. Uh, one thing we get for free is because all of this is a monad, we can use all our nice monadic and applicative operators. So if we went uh, in the last line, instead of like reading two things in two lines and then uh, applying a function, then I'm, I'm just using applicative to just, you know, apply the division to these two things. Uh, so, well, this is also, I find, really nice. You can, because you are writing essentially monadic code, well, you can use your monadic goodies to, to get smaller programs. Uh, but if you think about many of the algorithms which use mutable structures and are very difficult to like rewrite into a functional language, what happens is that they have some kind of hash table, some kind of table where you do lookups or you try to... So Imagine like the typical graph algorithm. You need to have a list of visited nodes. And essentially, it's like a big list, and you just say, oh, I visited this or that or that. And this is very difficult to, to have like a very nice pure implementation because just updating this list is going to cost some, uh, some performance. So instead of that, you can use not a single cell, but uh, what, uh, what is available to us in Haskell, which are kind of complete the structure which are mutable. And Hackage uh, provides many of those kind of structures. So you have arrays, which could be like, you know, the, the typical length index list. And well, the best one I found is from the vector package, although you have another array package, which is built in, but vector usually have a nice inter nicer interfaces. And you also have hash table from the hash table package, where you have like, all kind of hash tables, sometimes some, some of them have better insertion run, uh, performance, some have better lookup performance. You just go there and find, find five or six of them. So uh, I was mentioning graph algorithms. So why don't we try to write a graph algorithm? And it's going to be uh, the typical graph traversal. Just start with, uh, with, uh, with some node, and you try to find out 
what are the notes you can get from, from this starting note. Uh, to make the thing simple, I'm not really using a lot of new types and a lot of type trickery, just uh, notes are going to be represented by ints and a graph is going to be represented by a list of list of notes so that uh, the list at position n gives you the neighbors of this nth node in the graph. So for example, the graph there would look like four things, zero, one, two, and three, and the first node will, be, will have an arrow to one, and the second to zero, and two, and so on. So if you, if you try to do the typical traversal algorithm, what's all one of the things you need in order to uh, terminate is a list of visited nodes because well essentially the algorithm goes like you start with zero you try to get all the things you can get from zero and you go to one but now you have to visit all the things you can go to one so if you try to now go to zero again you will go into a loop so you need to to say hey i've already visited zero so i'm not going to visit again so that's that's quite quite normal quite simple algorithm so if we try to do a pure implementation, we end up with something similar to this. Uh, we, uh, we keep uh, a list of nodes, which are the list of nodes to visit after the current node. This is going to be this one, this sequence of nodes. And then uh, we ke keep a list of visited nodes, which is going to be this thing I accumulate. At, uh, well, just one small thing, I'm, I'm using this seek of node, which is kind of a list, but with better performance, because otherwise, if I try, I mean, I will show you a demo. This is going to be much slower than the mutable reference one, but if I use list instead of sequence, it's going to be even worse. So I don't think it's fair to use the worst possible data structure, because of course, then the performance is going to be much worse. Uh, but essentially, the, the thing is that at every point, we need to uh, update the things. Uh, yeah, update the things we are reaching. So this, well, at least for me, it, it takes some time to understand. So why don't we look at the at the ST version, where we it's really like the thing we were thinking. So we have a queue of nodes to visit next. We have a list of reachable nodes which we found we can we can get to and a list of visited nodes, and we just use while, while we have something on the queue, just pick the next thing on the queue. I'm, I'm like by this line. And then write all the neighbors in the queue and uh, write this node into the list of visited nodes. And we just do it all around. And at the end, we just read the list of reachable nodes at the very end. So this is... Uh, quite simple translation of your textbook algorithm into ST references. Uh, just a uh, small thing, so I, I use some monadic utilities that are not in the prelude, but it's essentially, if you try to read the code, you need to know what it, if m, which is like a monadic if and a while m, which is essentially try to test, and if this thing is true, just keep going and until you, you reach a false. So. Okay, so does it really work? Let me show you. So, uh, does it show here? Yeah. So, this is the same code. Ah, can you read it? Okay, maybe I can do it better. Uh, Okay, let's assume this is enough. So I have a way to generate random graphs of any amount of nodes. So it takes some time. I generate a random graph. And now let's try to run the thing from the graphs and get all the elements reachable from node zero. Now what happened? 
Ah, it's, it's the other way around. So it takes some time. Ah, yeah, it's with the sequence. It's exactly the same code. I hope it doesn't. OK, and it gets the result. And if I use the ST version, you can see it's much, much uh, faster. So uh, you would expect this to be the case. Uh, OK. Uh, it is pure. Uh, at the end, you, you call, so if you look here, at the end, I have this run st, which is the thing sort of uh, enclosing the monadic part, enclosing the state, and not allowing any of this state to go out to the outside world. So by, by anybody using this thing, you can see, well, I don't show the type, but, but it's not in I.O. It's or, or in any monad. It, the result is really a list of nodes. Well, um, uh, essentially here, I need, uh, I need to have this accumulated thing to have the list of visited nodes. And, and updating this thing costs a lot, because if you think about it, essentially it has to run up to the point where, where uh, I, I have this check whether this thing is visited or not, and then you can reuse the rest of the list. So it, it takes time. Have, it has to look around to get to this point. Maybe this could be done a bit faster by using any kind of data structure which allow me to point to different things. But anyway, if you have like a thousand of nodes, you have to recreate each of these structures at every step. Whether here we just have one thing which are mutating all the time. I mean, it, it's not magic anyway. I mean, this is an algorithm where you really get a lot of performance gains. But in other cases, it's, it's more it might not be sensible to use this approach. Yeah? So when you're inside the ST monad, it's doing mutations without referencing memory exactly? In ST monad, you are really like changing a cell in memory. So it's really it like. It knows about memory. Huh? It knows about memory? Locations and like non. That seems not pure, but, but it's not like hiding it. I mean, at the, at the bottom line, so yeah. the implementation is going to do something fast, something, uh, something which does I.O. Uh, the trick here, so the important thing here is that in contrast to I.O., you are only allowed to do things which handle these variables. So you are not in, in an ST block, you cannot run something from the network. You are only allowed to manipulate these things. And that's what it allows us to like enclose at the very end this thing and ensure that nothing is going outside because we can we cannot have any other side effect than reading and writing to these memory locations. They are contained in to this block, yeah. If you don't want them to be contained, you have the version which works in IO, which is called IO refs. Uh, they have exactly the same interface, put, read, modify, uh, but they live in IO. So this has the, the good thing is if you have several I.O. computations, you can search these variables, whether in the other case your variables are enclosed in a scope and you cannot really share between different computations which might need to reuse this thing. Uh, the downside is, of course, now it's impure. And if you are using I.O. ref, a, a big part of your program will have to live in I.O. Uh, what is nice anyway is that uh, there is a package called primitive which allows you to, to parameterize things on either IO refs or ST refs. So if you're writing a library, you can, you can make your end users decide whether they want to use IO or ST refs. Uh, to finish with this, I cannot, I can stop without mentioning the terrible global variable hack that people use. And this only works in GHC because very special combination of things. Uh, the idea here is just some, uh, when some people want to keep like a global state in a library, instead of like wanting to have like a, a variable going around all the time, they think, well, I will just put it on an IO ref. And then uh, when I need this variable, I will read it 
and then use unsafe perform IO to do like this was a pure thing. So of course this would only block uh, this will only work if you are very careful in only initializing the variable once and all the other time you are treating you are really treating this as a constant. Uh, but if you want to know how it works, well, you just create an, a new IO ref and then you do this and self perform IO which uh, you are you are saying like you know you know what I know what I'm doing so get me from IO like this was a pure value. But if you only this like the two lines in, in white, this wouldn't work. And this is because GHC tries to inline a small computations. So what will happen is that you wouldn't have a shared value. You will have just every time like a new reference cell being created. So you need to have this line in purple which says do not inline. So this is only gonna be done once when you uh, ask for number of threads the, the same time, the first time, yeah. <coughs> So, so what I would say is don't use it, <laughs> but in, in, a, in a talk about uh, mutable references, this is a pattern that now it's less and less used in Haskell code, but used to be used uh, in, in real applications. So I thought it, it's something you need to understand. And I also think that if you understand this code, you also get a lot of information about how laziness works in GHC and why you really need to this no in line thing. So I think it's something nice to understand, uh, something which you shouldn't use. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so you will have like usually like an initialization thing. Imagine like reading your config file and then you use write uh, IO ref again with an unsafe perform IO and write this thing and then and then in the rest they will just read it as it is was a constant. Is there yeah, I mean you can just use your own uh, reader mona to have this thing around. You have now like implicit parameters you can use in GHC. There are many other ways. So if if you go to the Haskell wiki and look at if you write the global variable hack, you will find people discussing all kind of things that you can do instead of doing this. So enough for global variables. Let's go to something which is the par monad, which is uh, this hidden parallelism I was talking about. So uh, there are two packages which are called monad par and abstract par. The, the second one is like an abstraction of the first one actually, which gives a simple interface to parallelize computation across threads. Uh, so you really let the runtime decide when to create a thread and all of that. But you have some kind of variable, which is called IVARS, although I guess more people will think of it more like a promise or like a future in other languages, which you can use to communicate between computations. So the simple interface is this thing. You call run par, which again works in, in a monad, call par, and that just Give, runs this thing in parallel with other things and gets you back the end result. Uh, and if you want to create several of these threads, you use a spawn P. So uh, it, it, the name sort of says like you should spawn a new thread, but it's not really what it's going on. This spawn is telling the runtime, hey, I, I would like to do this in parallel, but the runtime will ultimately decide whether this is really done in parallel or not. Uh, and well, there are a bunch of things you need to know. Well, uh, you need this thing to have NF data, which essentially gives you a way to uh, completely normalize the entire computation, but it is not enough. And actually, this, all of these things can be uh, automatically derived, so we are good. Uh, but look, the spawn P doesn't give you back par A, but par of I bar of A. And this I bar is going to be this promise, this future, which if we read, will block until we actually get the information there. So uh, imagine a very simple example in which we want to factorize two numbers, but we want to do this in parallel. We can just write this simple, uh, this simple function, 
we can just go into the part monad. So this is this is the first run part, which at the end will do like run st will ultimately return a pure comp uh, a pure value, and then we just say well factorize x and factorize y, and please try to do this in parallel if you can with a spawn p. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you need to compile it with slash threaded, or otherwise it will just go and run it into into one thread. And but huh? Dash and, dash and yeah, I, I some I, I forgot that if if right now this is automatically done or but yeah, you might need to specify how many cores and so on. But in the code, you just specify this spawn p, trying to say how many parallelism you can do and the runtime. Is the one ultimately deciding basis on, based on these things. And, and just like in SP you cannot do other IO operations. No. This is just really a spawn P, get, and we will see we ha you have a put. Uh, anyway, so here we just spawn these two, these two threads, and then uh, once we want to block uh, and get the, the result back, we use get. So this factor X bar is going to be this promise, and we just try to get this thing and try to get the second thing. So. This will actually result in, into these two things being factorized in parallel. Yep. Um, is part, are part and I bar like linked together, or are there other things that use I bar? Uh, yeah, we'll see another thing which use I bar. Uh, yeah, so the other thing you can use I bars for is to declare some kind of data flow of your thing. So imagine that. Uh, B and C depend on A and D depends on B and C. So what you can do is, uh, using the IVARS, uh, try to uh, explain this data flow and then the parallelism will try to get as much parallelism as possible. Uh, so this is the case, for example, and this is an example I got from the documentation in which we try to, uh, to get four, uh, four different threads and then each one, well, the first one needs A, so it, it sort of declares D by saying, I want to get the result of A, and then I put something on B, and then because this one gets B and also gets C, has to, has to wait until these two things are done. And you can imagine the runtime sort of trying to reuse one of the threads if, if this thing is finished once we, once we are there. Uh, so is it clear how this other part works. Okay, <clears throat> but there is a problem with I bars. I bars are all of nothing. So either you have the result or you don't have the result. And that's everything you can wait for. Uh, but there are some computations where you can. Yeah? Oh, I, I don't remember actually. <laughs> I'll, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Huh? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, anyways, I was saying there are some times where you can so computation can start producing a result and you can start working on it before you know having the entire computation. Uh, so a precondition we need here is something which is called monotonicity, which essentially says if you have more information and you've done, so if you have some information and did work with this information, having more information shouldn't destroy everything you've done because otherwise this kind of be, you really need to wait or it's just a waste of, of your time of computer's time. Uh, so there are many kinds of monotonic structures. So, so for example, an I bar is like a, a, a case of a monotonic structure, a very simple one where you either have nothing and then the anything, well, what you can do is essentially nothing, or you have all the information and you don't destroy anything because you had nothing. But you can have, for example, sets that grow. So uh, things or lists or sets where you can only add elements and you can start doing computation supposing that one element is there uh, and this information will never, you know, will never be destroyed because you, you will only grow into elements. So this, will, this gives you a way to 
start doing computation earlier. Or, you know, maps where keys are only added, things like that. So there is a, a nice package called Elfish, uh, which extends monad parse with this kind of monotonic structures. Uh, yeah, I cannot explain much more about this. It's, it's kind of interesting how, how you can do it, and it's kind of also a bit complicated how to tell the compiler that all of these are monotonic and so on. Uh, but it's a nice thing. If you, if you are interested, just look at the, at, the, at the package because it's quite well documented. I mean, Haskell code is usually very poorly documented, and this one is really, really good compared to any other. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, questions about I bars and L bars and oh yeah, that's uh, that's all. Uh, I just wanted to say there that th this is the same thing which is happening with both ST and PAR. You do your computations. You declare how this thing should work uh, with references and variables. But then, from the outside, everything you do is still pure. So uh, it uses the same trick at ST. As I said, if I have time, I will tell you at the end. <coughs> and and well, uh, one nice thing of Elvis is that uh, actually in the par monad, there is a pos that your types are not uh, strong enough to disallow using a variable from one par computation in another par computation, which is something you don't want to happen because you want like this to, to handle all the things. And this just re turns into runtime error. Uh, but you can do the same trick as they do in SD and not have and check this at compile time. So this is, I mean, even if you only use Elvis to replicate what monad par does, you can still get a bit more of type safety. Okay, <coughs> oh, oh. Uh. so manual concurrency. So let's, let's get out of all our pure world and all the niceties and let's go into the hardcore stuff. So what if we want to spawn new threads in Haskell? We use, well, it's simple. We just use this thing uh, called fork IO, which just creates a new thread and runs this in parallel with any other threads. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, Fork.io doesn't create a real operating system thread. It uses what, it's, what Haskell people call a lightweight thread or a green thread. It's essentially managed into a special thread pool, and it's much more efficient than uh, OS uh, threads. Um, and Fork.io, actually, I'm, I'm not using anything there. I'm just you know, like printing all the numbers uh, using different threads. But Fork.io gives you also an identifier which you can use to like kill or delay a thread or many of those things. So as usual in every other tutorial involving threads, I'm not going to do any useful, useful work. I'm just going to fake that we are using useful work by delaying the threads a number of milliseconds. And for this, you use thread delay. So thread delay just uh, stops your current thread for some number of milliseconds doing nothing at all. Uh, yeah, and actually, this is a very bad kind of delay thing because it only warranties that it will stop at least the amount you say, but it might be awoken much later. Never earlier, but much later. So don't use it for any kind of real-time thing. But, okay, if we use fork IO, the most thing we can do is essentially, well, have some information already computed and just print it or save it in different threads, but we cannot really do some useful stuff. If we want to use, do useful stuff, we need to communicate across threads. We need to share some state. So imagine a web server where every connection is a new lightweight thread, and you want to share some, some state, some connection to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the database, things like that. You may also want to distribute several work and results, like a master state relation, or messaging, these kind of things. And even more important, you need a kind of <clears throat> variables. You need to some kind of communication to manage your critical sections. Because you don't want people to you know, just go into the database and talk to it completely independent. You might need, you might need to wait, stop, because somebody's using this database now. And when you're done, the next one goes. So this, these are all things which 
in Haskell will be managed by, by these kind of variables. So what actually the answer is another kind of bar called M bar. And no, I don't know either what is the M stands for. I guess it would be mutable variable in contrast to the immutable variables. So that will be this make it a variable variable. Uh, so you just can create them. And you see that the result is going to be in IO. And you can put stuff there. One important thing is that these M bars have also two states, like E bars. They can be either empty or full. The difference with I bars is that we will be able to change this state. So we, we will be able to have a full thing with information and take it out and make it empty. Or we can have an empty thing and put something there. <coughs> but if we try to put into something which was already filled, then this, the thread is blocked until the things become empty. And actually, if several of them are waiting to see what is empty, uh, the runtime just sleep, uh, awakes one of them non-deterministically. So you don't really have warranties like the first put is going to be the first one to be awoken. You, it can be whatever. Uh, but putting things is not is only half of the job. You also need to read the things. So you have these two ways to read stuff. You have uh, take m bar or read m bar. Take m bar takes the result and also makes the m bar empty, which means that at least mon uh, well only one can be awoken because the rest of them which are waiting to take the m bar will see an empty thing, so only one is, is awoken. <clears throat> and you have read m bar which keeps the m m bar in the same state, so everybody waiting on read m bar if if it was empty if it becomes full all of them will be awoken at the same time sort of i mean not at the same time but will be awoken with the same value uh, and actually in this case you have this nice warranty that you are warranted to receive exactly the next put so it's it not can be the case that you are reading and somebody is taken well then all the reads get the same the first put and then the take sort of gets the put and and empties the thing so let's try to do some again, but this time using M bars with real threads. Uh, we're going to have three different M bars, one to share the sum, one to count how many elements we've run into the list, and then one which we will use as a semaphore to know whether we have obtained the end result. So this is, will be like the main thread will wait until this M bar is filled, and when it's filled, it knows that the end result is there. So the code in this case is very long, but essentially the purple parts are just creating the M bars and, uh, and waiting for the M bars to end. And then the, the green part is what it's done in every thread. So for every element in your sum, which is something here. So for every element in your list, well, we fork a, a new thread. We fake that we are doing something useful. And then we just uh, take the M bar and update the result with the new X. That's everything what we are doing here. Uh, and with just some random, so, it, so otherwise it looks like we are doing something sequentially. But if you, if you run this program, it looks like things are going in different, in different order. And then as I said, we, try, we count how many of the things were already done by updating these things. And if all of them are done, then we tell the semaphore, here we are done, so this thing will be awoken, and we can read the, the result. So this is all a bit messy, because Haskell by default doesn't allow you to wait on a thread, which is what we need. We want to say, well, every thread should do their job, and we just want to wait for every thread to finish. Uh, but there is a package which is very nice, which is threads, which has a version of fork IO, which allows you to uh, wait on a thread. So the, sec the result is not only going to be the identifier of the thread, also a computation you can run to wait for the thread. Uh, so just executing, uh, exec uh, sort of executing this second part of the pair is going to be equivalent to waiting for the thread. So this is the code which looks more reasonable than the previous one. So I think it's better to focus here. So again, we are creating a sum to handle this sort of shared state, which is the sum of all the elements. 
and then for every element on the list, we will spawn a new thread. We'll do some heavy work here by delaying the thread. And, and then we just take the value and add, some, some, uh, add the, the thing to the value. Because the take, when we take the m bar, we make it empty. We know that no other thread can read the variable at the same time. So this is very important because otherwise, you know, some two things could collide and then the sum wouldn't be updated with all the rest. So this model of computation allows you to, to have like critical sections by just having a shared variable. And at the end, we just put the sum. So once we finish with all the elements, we can just take the m, the m bar. So uh, any questions about this code? OK, but uh, if you read the documentation of m bar, they tell you explicitly, do not use them if you need to perform larger atomic operations, such as reading for multiple variables. Use empty ends instead. So even the creators of this see m bars not really as something you should use, but something you should use to build larger blocks, some larger abstractions. Uh, some of this abstraction is <clears throat> actually channels. Some people use m bars for channels because essentially if you put, you are like putting this on a queue because everything else will be waiting and then you get something and then the next thing can put something on the queue. Uh, but everything will be sort of a stop on putting things. So instead of n bars, it's, it's better to just use channels, which are implemented with n bars, but expose a nicer interface. So you have many, many of them. You have chan for control.concurrent.chan, and you have some others on STM, which actually will be our uh, last and, and final kind of uh, model, transactional variables, or software transactional memory. This is, a ve it's, this is like a high level view on concurrent programs where each computation is divided on blocks that have to be atomic and this atomicity is going to be warranted by the runtime. Uh, but uh, instead of like blocking everything to be atomic, it uses something which in, in, in pure functional languages is a bit more performant, which is optimistic concurrency control. So essentially, in STM, instead of blocking the resources, we'll just try to run your block and then we will check, hey, was something changed since I started running this block? And if it doesn't, then well, that's okay. We can do our, our thing was executed atomically. But if something changed, well, we just rerun the whole comput computation instead. And this actually can only be done if you think about it because everything we have here is pure because otherwise retrying can lead to other side effects. So if you program in Clojure, for example, which is the language which introduces this idea into programming and make it practical, you had problems if you tried to like print things because, well, you might be retried 10 times and then the print is executed 10 times. So think if instead of printing is something like writing to a file or doing some network thing. Uh, so, how you mark an atomic block? You just use atomically. So atomically take an STM block and run and runs it atomically to any other block. Uh, and the result is in IO because it, it might need to spawn new threads, need, may need to retry. So these are things which are sort of impure. So the result of running something atomically is really an IO computation. Uh, but because the atomic block is an STM, we are warranted to only run pure computations and some special STM actions, which are those actions. You can either create new variables, you can read them and write them as usual. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and sometimes you just want to do create new vars directly on iOS. You just have some versions for this. This is not really important. It's just a convenience. So if we want to do the same sum, but now using STM, the, all this thing will be the same. You will do the same block. The, on, the only thing which needs to change is that now the access to the shared state, which is the sum, is the one which needs to be protected in, into an atomic block. So it's changed to this. So now this read and write is going to be, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be warranted 
to be run atomically for any other thing. So it's, it's like a bit more high level because here we are not really uh, waiting on put or anything like that. We are really like saying we want to read and write this thing and we just want to execute all of it atomically. Uh, yeah. Uh, yep. Uh, actually, it's, the runtime is quite good. They put some effort on this. So if you have several atomic blocks which do not share resources, they can be executed concurrently. It's only that things which use the same resources need to be separated from each other. Uh, also, in this case, the, so the difference is not that big because we are basically exchanging read m bar with uh, read t bar and uh, put m bar with write t bar, but in larger examples where maybe the the control of concurrency ne it's it's a bit more delicate. Where uh, m bars can, for example, lead to deadlocks, and this model cannot lead to a deadlock because you are just declaratively declaratively specifying what you need, but not actually blocking on these things. Uh, and as in the case of m bars, if you use t bars, these transactional variables you can build larger structure with many kinds of different properties. So you can have queues, you can have channels, and all of that has the same underlying model of atomicity, but uh, I suppose it's a, a more high level interface. Uh, actually, I made uh, a nice example of implementing uh, a chat using STM and conduit streams. So like these things you only have in Haskell, and well, you can look at the result, which is yeah, like a chat thing which works with the network and all of that, but it's really like a state, uh, a pure part, some STM to manage charge the state, and some, some streams to go in and out of the network. So conclusion, <clears throat> mutable variables exist in Haskell, which as a result makes Haskell the best imperative language ever. <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, we can see that in, in this case, purity give us the freedom to uh, have some kind of a structure like STM, like PAR, uh, which we couldn't have if your things are not weren't warranted to be uh, pure because you cannot retry things, you cannot isolate things. And, and the other takeaway from this talk should be that different S scenarios in Haskell require different kinds of variables depending on the concurrency needs uh, and also depending of, of whether you want to manage logs. So in most of Haskell code bases, you don't really need locks. You don't need semaphores. All of this is usually taken care, uh, taken care by, by a higher level interface. And again, well, this is again the same variable landscape. So since we have some minutes, I can try to explain you how run as this where type actually enforces that the variables do not escape. Uh, so if, if, you, if you look carefully at the type of new stref which create a variable, uh, all strefs handle a tag, this s. So why do you need this s? What, what it, it looks like a state, but it's real, it will be something like will identify a type level uh, where, in which block this variable has been created. So the for all in this case, this for all s, uh, prevents mixing references because essentially this for all is, is, is telling the compiler run st is gonna choose, it's gonna be able to choose the tag. So it, it can choose a new one every time, preventing this mixing. So if you try to like to get a variable from run st and try to run into another run st, you cannot do this because the first run st has fixed the s in the first block. So you cannot give it to the second run st because the second run st is parametric on the label. You see, so uh, I don't know if that's clear. Uh, yeah? So, so does it mean that um, a compiler can somehow new type is being created for each? It doesn't have to. So it's only a type level thing. So the way for all works, which essentially it's like inside of the compiler, every time you see a for all, it's like you make a new, it's called a readit variable for this s, and these are all different. So this is only a, is something which warranties that things won't be mixed, but you don't have to have any kind of runtime representation. This is all type level thing. This is type level trickery. Okay.
More questions? If they are not hard, you may get an answer. <laughs> Understanding the landscape of exceptions, I'm not clear on how exceptions work in sort of threading and how sort of things happen. We would need hours to discuss this. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I was about to say you could just run exceptions inside your thread and just bump everything up into like the left side of an either. Right. I've heard that, but. I'm but not you, you also have exceptions in Haskell. Right. They are right. so. Uh, the main problem is that actually in Haskell you have like synchronous exception and asynchronous exceptions. Yeah. So any of those threads, uh, I didn't show it, but but we can. Uh, do I have no? Okay. But if, if you look at the documentation of of like uh, the thread part, you have something called throw to, which allows you to throw an exception in another thread. So like asynchronously, hey, here is an exception for you. So you can use it like for a killer thread. People use it for communication. But it makes everything very messy. So uh, yeah, my. It's like any guidelines or anything. Like, here's where you should go look. So uh, uh, do you have an answer, a better answer? Yeah, that's along the lines what I'm going to say. So try to use libraries which manage this for you because Smarter people will have think of all the possible cases. Usually, dealing with them yourself, uh, well, it might work because I mean, well, I don't you might deal with it myself. I at least want to know about what yeah. these so issues are. Yeah. So, a sync would be a, a good thing to look at. It it sort of manages this thing, and there are other ones uh, which also sort of take care of converting the exceptions to accept the and things like that. Okay, thanks. Thank you.